it. And we are now recording. So you can't back out now, guys. So welcome, uh, uh, everyone, to our second uh, uh, panel discussion. Um, uh, we had one uh, not too long ago uh, about learning management systems. This one's on leveraging mobile devices to further teaching and learning. Uh, uh, and uh, I've got some slides to share with you here. Uh, you should have been emailed these uh, uh, as well. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So um, uh, it looks like everybody's already got your uh, microphones and cams, if you're just an attendee, uh, muted by default. Uh, but if for whatever reason they weren't already, uh, please see that they are um, uh, so as to uh, allow our panelists' discussion uh, not to get any uh, interference. If you have questions, um, uh, find the chat window uh, uh, and go to the chat window. A lot of people are already uh, uh, interacting in the chat window, so uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, everyone. Um, uh, and uh, pose your questions there. Uh, Mike and Julius uh, uh, will be going through the chat and pulling out questions uh, as they arise and bringing them up. Um, uh, I already mentioned that we're recording this. We'll let you know uh, when uh, the recording is available. So jumping right in, um, uh, we've got three great panelists uh, uh, for you today. And they are uh, Dr. John Bansovich. Uh, he's the Director of Learning Technologies uh, uh, and the Center for Instruction and Technology at the University of San Francisco. He recently co-hosted the iPad in Higher Education Conference. That sounds awesome. Nick Yates uh, is joining us from the other side of the world. He's an instructor, instructional designer in the Center um, for Educational Innovation at Zayed University. And he's also an Apple Distinguished Educator. He's taught a lot of one-to-one -one tablet classes and has produced uh, uh, some action research projects from, uh, from this teaching and learning. And finally, our third panelist, uh, Dr. Dion Zell. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, all of you should have seen our pronunciation gazetteer emails uh, uh, that were going uh, back and forth uh, as I was um, confirming the pronunciation of everyone's names. It was quite funny. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Zell is the Associate Vice President for Academic Technology at Cal State Northridge. Uh, she oversees the CSUN tablet, CSUN tablet, I forgot to ask about how they call that initiative, a one-to-one -one tablet deployment, uh, which has received uh, national attention. So. Jumping right in, uh, uh, we have a question here about past initiatives, uh, experiences, and data. And uh, all three of our panelists will have a chance uh, uh, to chime in on this one. So our first question is, what formal initiatives involving mobile devices have you been involved with at, at an institution of higher education? Describe that initiative. What was your role in it? How did it come about? How was it funded? Um, how many students were impacted by it? Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the institution and what data uh, uh, you might have on student success and retention as a result of it. We'll get started with John. So take it away, John. Thank you, Georges. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to share a little bit about the work that we've been doing here at the University of San Francisco in terms of mobile technologies. We uh, started early on in terms of the iPads um, when they were released out in 2010. We, uh, we began that summer training faculty, 40 faculty, to utilize the iPads in their classrooms and then uh, report back to their colleagues and myself, who was leading the initiative, on how iPads could be used in classrooms. Um, so that was the early beginnings, is you know, getting faculty exposed to iPads, um, and then moving from there, involving students. So uh, following that, we took a couple of years to uh, introduce iPads and using iPads in the curriculum in a digital technologies and teaching program in the School of Education. It involved 50 students and eight faculty. Uh, it was a two-year endeavor. Um, I led the effort with a colleague. We uh, conducted it in a research format. It was a study. Uh, we, have, we had interviews and surveys, uh, and this is where we presented our findings at the first iPad in higher ed conference in Cyprus in 2014. Um, I would say the main findings from that study was the student satisfaction levels increased. Um, it, this is a program in School of Education, so I think many of you are aware that iPads are used today in K-12 programs, so this really helped to prepare those students um, so that they were ready to use this type of technology when they were placed in schools. Um, following that, in 2015, last year we launched an initiative a broader initiative involving three programs, all graduate programs, 100 students, 30 faculty. Again, this was an iPad one-to-one -one initiative. We've been focusing on iPads because uh, Apple has such an excellent um, education department and support. And I think at this point, iPads are really still the lead in terms of uh, mobile technologies. The tablet is clearly the leader. 
uh, it's the most widely used. So we've been, we've been continuing with iPads. Um, this latest endeavor that involves 100 students and 30 faculty, um, it was sort of the early beginnings of looking at sort of a broader expansion of uh, tablet initiatives on the campus. We're using this as a pilot so that we can gather information and present that to leadership. Um, we're including surveys, end of semester surveys. Uh, we have three leads, one in each of the programs who are helping to drive this and to work with their faculty to, to, um, to support them in the, in the effort. Um, so interviews and observations will take place next semester with both students and faculty so that again, we can learn from this pilot and then uh, potentially broaden it next year in 2017. Um, so that's a little bit about our initiatives here with, with mobile technologies. It's a, been a very controlled effort in terms of, you know, um, looking at data uh, in terms of the, through surveys and observations and interviews. Excellent. Thanks, John. Nick, your own experiences? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, much different to John. Uh, our, um, our mobile learning initiative actually started out as a whole university um, project or implementation in phases. Uh, the rumor had it uh, back in 2011 that the Minister for the Higher Education in the United Arab Emirates uh, personally liked using the iPad and thus uh, the universities, um, including Zayed University, then uh, the rumor has it that started using the iPad. So that's how it all came about. Um, we started in phases going through the foundation program first, then uh, through the um, uh, four years uh, of uh, students uh, going through their uh, work. So as students would go from year to year, the uh, phases would push forward and different uh, courses. So um, 100, 200, 300, 400 level courses would then get students who would come through only with iPads. Um, and thus a mobile learning initiative, uh, I suppose, came about in the UAE, the UAE style. Uh, my role in it was uh, primarily, first of all, as a faculty member. Um, I was uh, working with the foundation program. I piloted uh, one of the first courses uh, back in 2011. Uh, then uh, I was finishing up my second master's at the time, and I became a faculty fellow in the newly formed uh, Center for Educational Innovation. Um, and then after that, became an instructional designer uh, in the CEI. Um, I suppose uh, some of the things that, uh, well, the, the number of students impacted is quite remarkable, um, probably up, upwards of 5,000 students. Uh, we have two campuses in two different cities. Um, I have a little bit of data um, from a recent study by a colleague, Troy Priest, um, and I wanted to share that with you. We've got a 69% mobile learning penetration rate uh, coming out of a qualitative um, survey that equals 176 courses out of 255 utilizing mobile learning in some way. Um, breaking that down, um, the top five responses was uh, students are receiving content, um, then students are using uh, mobile learning or mobile devices for skills development. Um, the third one was formative assessment. Uh, fourth one was student uh, production of uh, presentations or assignments. And lastly, collaboration. And if we break that down into the SAMA framework, um, it's mainly condensed at the lower, le le uh, lower levels of substitution and augmentation, uh, according to uh, Troy's analysis of the different types of activities. Um, student success and retention, I don't have any specific numbers, but we do have a big scholarship of teaching and learning push. And so this research is coming out uh, slowly as uh, faculty members uh, start and uh, finish their projects um, at different rates. So it is interesting to see the um, types of projects being done. So thanks, that's, that's it for me. Excellent, thanks Nick. And Dr. Zell. Yes, good morning, thank you. So our initiative began in 2013 in the fall, so we're in our sixth semester, and it all got started when our president uh, visited Apple and was sort of wowed at the learning potential for tablets. So came back and basically invited our faculty to join the initiative. About 70 faculty raised their hands and said yes. And 
they had to enter as a department, so they had to agree to come on board, not just one person, but as a group and commit to at least three sequential classes so the students would get the most out of the iPads. And we began, uh, we're now up to eight departments, including some big ones like biology and psychology. And my role was really the point person uh, with the faculty to oversee uh, faculty training and uh, all the support for the, the initiative. Uh, how was it funded? Our faculty received iPads, so we funded those, but the students were required to purchase their own. So the formal goals of the program were to increase the quality of content I'll get to that in a moment, and increase engagement, and finally reduce costs. And I can explain more about that as well. We had a parallel e-text initiative going on at the same time, which is really serendipitous because that enabled us to really focus on content. So faculty started creating their own iBooks and using them in the classes. And uh, now we are actually moving into the world of app development. So we just published our fourth app in the uh, Apple App Store um, so, so that students can learn that way. Uh, we do have some data on student success. We developed a micro-assessment technique to really c compare and isolate the, not tablets, right, because it's not about the technology, but really how they're used. So we found that the impact was really due to active learning. And uh, we, a famous phrase that began to circulate around our campus was that students can no longer escape learning. Because in the classroom, they, they simply had to learn um, but they had to actually draw out, for example, mitosis and submit the picture of it right there in class. So there was sort of greater positive pressure to engage. And what we saw is that, you know, the A students are going to get A's no matter what, but it really helped the D students come up for C's and the C students come up for B's and so on. So it really helped those who needed it the most. But we've seen many, many different uses. I'm just describing one in biology, but they were used in many different ways in many different departments. So I should probably stop there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. So moving right along, uh, uh, we have a question about some bumps in the road. So uh, about challenges. What challenges have you encountered with uh, deploying and managing mobile devices? And how, if at all, were these challenges resolved? So we'll go back to John uh, uh, to begin here. OK, well, I would say definitely you know, one of the biggest challenges for us, uh, sort of, because we're sort of the, I would say, compared to both Dion and, and the other speaker, we're sort of the newest or the small scale school who's sort of dipping our toes in the water and trying this out. So um, some of the lessons learned in terms of challenges has been funding and making sure that there's adequate funding um, for a broader initiative. Um, there's certainly, you know, you can find some seed money to, to do a pilot and then um, go ahead forward with it. But I think for long term and sustainability of such an effort and, and an initiative, you want to make sure that you have the the funding available to you. Um, one of the challenges we had is that we had a, um, a budget shortfall. Um, so, so that was a challenge as well as change in leadership. Our provost left the university. So, so we've had those, I'd say two biggest challenges was the provost who initially um, sort of spearheaded the effort um, has since left and is be, has been replaced. So working with the new leadership and, uh, and also a budget shortfall that we experienced due to some tuition shortfalls. Um, the other, I'd say the two other challenges would be, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about this when we, when we look at re recommendations, was you know, making sure that you have adequate time to prepare your faculty um, to, to introduce this, this type of technology into their curriculum, um, that there's time for them to uh, ramp up, to, to, to look at their course and find ways that they're going to use uh, iPads or tablets so that they're actually enhancing the student learning experience. And that takes time. Um, so do build in the time to, to prepare your faculty through professional development. And thirdly is uh, wireless, making sure that your infrastructure is, um, is good and that the wireless can accommodate uh, numerous devices in a classroom and uh, so that it contributes to a positive experience for both the students and the instructor. Um, so those are the, those I, I would say are the three the biggest challenges that I would like to present here. Great, thanks, Nick. What challenges have you encountered? Um, slightly different ones. Uh, coming from the whole university, uh, full of phases, uh, we've got uh, 100, 150 faculty uh, on each campus going through 
um, mobile learning the mobile learning implementation at one time. So we need really we really needed to manage the expectations, uh, manage the process uh, going along. Um, we needed, uh, I suppose, the the issue was uh, being bridging the IT uh, with what faculty uh, really need or really um, want. Um, so one area we tried to use is faculty fellows, um, those that may be considered instructional designers or even just uh, au fait with the IT and also know the pedagogy of the department that they're working in. And so these faculty fellows were seconded uh, to be a bridge between um, the IT and um, what faculty need. Um, that was in terms of professional development, um, but uh, being realistic with these sorts of things as well. Um, the next one, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, I've got another one, but uh, I think Dion might be bringing it up. So I'll just okay. leave it there. Great. All right. And Dion, your challenges? Okay. Well, yes, as we've heard from uh, both the previous speakers, definitely Wi Fi was our number one challenge. Um, just to, to cut to the chase, at any one point in time, uh, we would have hundreds of students taking a quiz on their iPads at the same time, as well as downloading assessments, you know, exams. And, you know, one blip in the Wi-Fi is a disaster. <laughs> one tiny millisecond of a blip, because suddenly everything goes crazy and the faculty member gets all upset. So we really had to build up our Wi-Fi and, and add a number of wireless uh, WAPs, wireless access points. Mm -hmm. um, so that was probably the number one. We finally overcame that one and now, um, our, our Wi-Fi is very stable. The second biggest one was probably uh, just faculty training. Our faculty were very interested, but getting them all together at the same time was difficult the first year. So we started with workshops. I think the second year we fixed that and actually developed a three-day tablet academy. So the first day really focused on everything they need to know about the, the iPad itself. Um, the second day was engagement, you know, how to use it in the classroom for T untethered teaching, because once once they had a tablet in their hand, they wanted to walk around, and they did not want to be tethered to the podium. And the third day was on content creation, so actually building the e-text. So, and and uh, like Nick said, gaining those faculty fellows and their enthusiasm was absolutely instrumental. That's probably the number one recommendation. Find those enthusiastic faculty, and they will do the work for you as evangelists. So I'll stop there. All right. We call that strong Wi-Fi signal here on campus. We call that brain cancer strength uh, uh, Wi-Fi. So uh, we have the same problem here. So moving right along, I'll go back to uh, Nick for uh, recommendations. So what recommendations would you have for an institution interested in adding mobile devices to teaching and learning? I know you can go on and on about this, uh, uh, but keeping time in mind, what are your best recommendations, Nick? Uh, sure. Yep. Uh, so I suppose if we, if we think about leadership, uh, in my context, uh, we needed the top down support for the bottom up leaders. Um, we needed the right people, um, uh, for the, to support the right tasks. Um, you know, when someone wasn't a right fit, you know, it, it was a bit tough. Um, so you need those, those, uh, as Dion said, evangelists, or sorry, Dion or George, um, you know, you need those evangelists in there. Uh, we needed to be flexible in solving the sorts of problems um, and getting the, the right person to come in, um, you know, get the problem solved and then get out of the way so that then learning, um, instruction and learning can then progress. Um, and then I'm going to say, um, I suppose one area that I feel like we've been a bit slow at, but what, what one recommendation I would make is to gather the evidence of success or failure um, just to just to go through action research cycles, um, learn from pilots, learn from uh, faculty members who are taking this on, um, encourage presentations within the university, research papers, um, leverage your own classroom in a scholarship of teaching and learning fashion. Uh, you need to build a narrative of what's happening uh, and collect that evidence. I feel that at Zide University, we went headfirst into the pedagogy and just making sure that you know each phase was was well well thought out and you know what did we learn but we didn't cap we didn't capture as much as we could um, and we didn't build up a, 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 the best narrative uh, to help us along the way so uh, to capture that evidence um, is important as well great thanks and John recommendations from you 
many of the same, um, but some additional ones. Certainly, you know, involve as many stakeholders as possible, from the president to the provost, the deans, department heads. Um, it was really, I think, I think it's so critical that you do have your leadership um, support for this type of initiative in order for it to grow, um, because again, they will provide the funding and support at all levels. Uh, we had a project manager who was helpful in sort of get, getting everyone around the table. So if you have a project manager who can help you who kind of coordinate all of the various pieces to this type of uh, initiative, that's a good thing. Um, and make sure that IT is involved. Clearly, they're going to have to, you know, prepare the classrooms. Uh, they need to make sure the environment is ready for this, uh, for the initiative, so that, uh, so that it's successful. That students are connecting, uh, and they're able to take quizzes, and the faculty are are successful as well. So get your help desk, uh, your classroom technology team, on board, and your Center for Teaching Excellence as well. Um, we involved student life. We wanted the student life uh, area of the university to be a part of this initiative. And as well, the library. I think the library have been, really been a critical part of, of uh, you know, sort of working with faculty. And, and our next stage of this is ebooks and e-text. So they're going to be working with us on that. Um, some other recommendations is start the planning early. So if you're going to launch this in the fall, give yourself at least a semester to, to build up the faculty capacity um, to use the technology in their classes. Um, so start early. I can't stress that enough. Um, you don't want to start in the summer for the fall. Give yourself one more semester to prepare the faculty, to prepare the environment. Um, professional development of faculty is critical. They need to feel supported at every sta stage along the way. Um, so that support needs to be there. We have to make sure that they're prepared, that they feel good about the initiative, and that support is so important. Um, so helping faculty to think differently about the in-class use of the technology and the projects and assignments. Along with that, provide an orientation for your students. Um, we think that the students today are, are very savvy with the technology, but um, they may know a lot about the social aspects and the entertainment but they don't necessarily know about the various apps and the tools that they're gonna use in the classroom and for their learning. So uh, provide an orientation for the students um, and multiple touch points for that PD. So um, it's not just at the start and the end of the semester, but it's um, providing that opportunity for faculty to come together, for those champions to be uh, visible and for the faculty to learn um, throughout the semester, throughout the initiative. So it's not, again, just at the beginning and the end of the initiative, but it's throughout the initiative that you're providing that support through professional development. Um, make sure that there's assessment. As Nick said, you wanna be able to demonstrate back to leadership that there are some, um, some gains to using this technology in the classroom. Uh, they wanna see uh, you know, some student learning outcomes. They wanna see increase in student satisfaction. They wanna see increase in retention. So make sure that you're building in uh, the assessment so that you can report back to leadership and to other stakeholders. Uh, get on the dean's calendar so that you can provide these updates to them that, uh, as, as to how the initiative is going, especially in their schools. Make sure it's funded. I can't stress that enough as well. Uh, make sure that there's adequate funding so that the pilot can continue in some, on some level and um, identify the champions. We've heard that already. Uh, provide incentives for faculty. They're going into this. You may give them an iPad as one incentives, incentive. Uh, it may not be enough for all, so find other ways to incentivize. Release time for faculty to work on their courses, stipends. Um, and lastly, provide resources and a community of learners so that participants can learn from one another. So it's just building that community for the participants, for the faculty, so that they can learn from one another and uh, continue to grow and, and, um, and you know, feel positive about it. Great, thanks, John. I'm gonna pull the car over for a minute here and turn to Julius uh, uh, and Mike, because it seems like there's some chatter in the chat window. Guys, uh, do you have a question that you've come across here that you think um, we should ask? Sure, this is Mike here. So I have a question here from Justin uh, Zephyrin. And the question is, about the faculty de development piece. And it was directed at Dion, but maybe the other two can also address it. So what are the tenets that are 
sort of comprised of the uh, faculty development? Like what, what components of the faculty development did you guys develop? What, what does it look like? How did you guys sort of focus on what aspect of uh, training? Sure. Well, first we provided, you know, the gamut of formats. So faculty could come in for a one hour workshop or a one day workshop, and that turned into a three day academy. So it was, you know, meeting faculty where they are and also going out to the departments, you know, not sitting here in our in our office spaces, but just getting out there and pulling faculty together. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we really focused on those three areas, you know, using the tablet, uh, presenting with the tablet, teaching with the tablet, and then content became king. So really, I think what sustained it is content. Um, so those are the three kind of pillars that we focused on and we continue to focus on. So we have ongoing faculty learning communities around those. Any other questions, guys? I would just add to that that, you know, I think all of our initiatives include the Apple, um, the iPad. Um, so, you know, utilize the services that are available through Apple, especially if you're just getting started. They have some excellent professional development, um, you know, distinguished educators. And so on several occasions, Apple has uh, sponsored um, special guest speakers to sort of broaden the initiative and awareness. So, you know, if you're using Apple products, um, you know, make sure that you're making use of some of the services that are, that are available through, through them and then have them train our trainers. So um, learn from their expertise. All right, um, Julius, do you have another? Yes, I have a question right on the tails of the, the sort of Apple, the Apple point. Um, Jeanette Coral asks about multi-platform usage. How have each of your programs handled the reality that students themselves own mobile devices prior to coming into the programs? For example, they might have Windows, Mac, Android, and they might want to use them for the same activities you had planned to do on a specific technology or mobile device. So I'm happy to jump in and quickly describe. Uh, we knew that would be a challenge going in, but the case was very strong for sticking with Apple. So we really rationalized it to students uh, that the tablets that they would be required to purchase, first of all, they could pay for them over time. We had a, an installment plan, uh, but they would be used to the max. So, they, and ideally they would end up saving costs in the long run. So I think we really justified it through the high level of engagement that we, we strove uh, to provide. Any of our other panelists want to chime in on that topic? Yeah, I can. Um, we've had actually a, a shift away from Apple um, with a new director of the uh, Centre for Educational Innovation. Uh, he brought his own ideas for BYOD. Uh, and so now we are technically a BYOD institute. Um, the shift away has resulted in, I suppose, less use of, um, it's actually the opposite of what Dion's talking about. It's maybe the less use of the iPad as a whole and uh, just utilizing specific apps. If those apps are available on their mobile phone, which every single student has one or two of, uh, you know, then we welcome uh, student use of their own device in that aspect. It's taken us a while to get there, um, but that's the shift that we've seen. Um, and teachers are now leveraging mobile phones as opposed to tablets um, more often than not. So yeah, um, that's our shift there. Great. Thanks guys. Moving right along, another question for you. This one's about apps and tasks. So what have been some of the most successful popular apps used uh, and or tasks that have been carried out with mobile devices at the institutions where you've been involved in their use? So we'll stay with you, Nick. You want to start with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mentioned uh, based on the, um, the feedback, uh, uh, at the beginning, um, so I'm going to stick with that. Uh, formative feedback was uh, the number three response from faculty of what they did with mobile learning in their course. Uh, I'm going to uh, shout out some apps that uh, some faculty are using to engage and make their class a little more interactive. Involved in these apps is some element of formative feedback. Uh, I'm going to then write them in the chat after. Excellent. So Nepod would be interactive presentations, Socrative, uh, a quiz app, Educanon, uh, allowing you to embed quizzes within uh, videos, um, Kahoot, which is a gamified quiz, and ClassKick, uh, individual self-paced work with immediate formative feedback. 
Um, so uh, it was reported by faculty that these were used for formative feedback. And the other one, uh, I suppose, is creation and production of uh, assignments and things like that. Um, edu creations, explain everything or show me is it all in the similar vein um, where you produce a narrated video. Uh, answer garden is a great one to show survey answers grow over time. Um, and as keywords are used multiple times, that word grows on the screen. Uh, snap guide, uh, so ebooks uh, and uh, super note for audio um, and also touchcast a free app that allows very allows a lot of uh, powerful things with videos. Um, so those would be some of the apps that are being mm. used and the types of things they're using for. Those are all great. Thanks. John? Yeah, those are some great ones. I wasn't familiar with many of them, so I'm looking forward to, to learning more about them. We have been using many of the, you know, sort of tried and true Google Docs. We're a Google campus, so Clearly, um, you know, collaboration is important for, for using these devices in the classroom. Um, so using Google Docs for that purpose. Um, we're, we're also a Canvas campus, so using the Canvas mobile apps. Um, Zoom for communications. Uh, we have a number of hybrid programs, and so Zoom has been a great solution on mobile. Uh, presentation apps, which are fairly standard, Keynote and PowerPoint. Uh, whiteboarding apps, um, we're, we're sort of exploring that area. Um, we haven't found the right one yet, but, but certainly that's a, that's a space that we want to further explore. And then productivity apps, Office, Notability for note-taking, Evernote. Um, I, we try to, I think one of the most interesting aspects to it is the content creation apps um, use, using iMovie and Adobe Slate, explain everything in their pod. Um, and really, I think those are new apps for faculty, so um, making sure that they're aware of the possibilities with those applications, especially for student projects. The mobile devices are so good about you know, being able to capture video and images, uh, so really having them think differently about student projects and using those apps. Lastly, um, you know, some of the polling apps, um, Socrative and Poll Everywhere being two of the ones that I would say are the most, most popular with our faculty. Great, thank you very much. Uh, if anybody else have it, has any uh, app suggestions uh, for uh, the group to try out and play with, feel free to add them uh, uh, to the chat window. It looks like we have a nice growing list of interesting, appealing apps. All right, so thanks guys. Uh, moving right along, we'll stay with you, John, for uh, question five about staffing. So any particular staffing issues related to mobile devices? Is there typically a full-time person over managing them, or is that just an additional duty? Uh, you know how they get you, other duties as a sign, all right? So uh, a, an additional duty for somebody already doing other things at the institution? Well, I would say because we're still the, sort of the newest in terms of, compare, in, as compared to my colleagues, um, we're, we've started small, so I oversee a center for uh, instruction and technology, so my staff are prepared for this type of initiative. It did add some extra work to, on their plates. Um, so we did add one additional person uh, to, to help fill in some of the gaps uh, in terms of picking up the work that we had to let go of in order to uh, support this initiative. Um, I think if the initiative continues to grow, we'll, we'll need to look at staffing in other areas, the help desk um, and IT. Uh, but at this point, because it's a smaller pilot, uh, one staff person, who, uh, who will continue if the initiative grows um, has been helpful. Um, so there definitely, staffing is an issue. If you're doing a pilot, you can pretty much get by with your, your current staff, but you do want to plan in or budget in for additional staff if the initiative grows. Um, yeah, so I would say those, are, those were you know, local staff within your Center for Teaching Excellence or uh, also considering instructional design support if you're going the route of ebook development, um, you'll want to have someone with some expertise uh, and also some folks uh, who are knowledgeable of copyright. Excellent, thank you. Dion, um, the staffing situation at your institution uh, and any recommendations? Sure, uh, we were fortunate to be able to hire two unique staff positions. The first was a, called a tablet technologist. 
So this person was responsible for helping faculty with anything uh, technology related with a tablet. Nice. And the other was a multimedia technologist. And that person really focused on content, whether it was capturing video, uh, teaching faculty how to use the pictures, et cetera. Um, then we also had our faculty fellows actually help teach some of the workshops. Apple was tremendously supportive, especially at the beginning. They actually came to the campus and taught some workshops. We learned everything that they taught and then sort of um, embraced the teaching in our own staff. And our instructional designers uh, also play a big role because the funny thing is when you start incorporating tablets, everything changes. And so faculty really as uh, they had to redesign their entire courses around tablets. So at the end, the instructional designers became key. So yes, we had dedicated staff. Great, all right. So moving right along uh, then, uh, uh, our next question is about operating systems. We've kind of talked a little bit about it, pros and cons uh, of them. So what are some advantages and disadvantages of various operating systems, uh, iOS, Android, Windows, et cetera, with regards to widespread managed use in an educational setting? So we'll go back to John uh, uh, first for this one. Well, there are definitely some practical benefits to having um, your initiative and your students and faculty on a single platform, um, which are pretty clear uh, just because of the simplicity of, you know, training and support. So if everyone's on an Apple device, you've got everyone using similar apps, um, the support again and the, the, uh, the pre preparation of the devices from IT, uh, one image for, for everyone. Um, but that may not always be practical, as, as, um, as my colleagues stated. Um, they're now doing uh, sort of a BYOD, which is a direction that we certainly will consider. Um, there, there is some interest in a BYOD initiative as well. Um, we support all flavors of de and devices through our help desk. Um, we standardized on the iOS when we were deploying um, the technology uh, and faculty needed one. The classroom technology is also something to consider. If you're doing wireless AV, uh, Apple TV is, is, I think, probably furthest along in terms of supporting uh, a wireless environment for your faculty so that they can be untethered and move around the classroom with their iPads. Uh, Reflector is also uh, pretty mature, and so that's a good application for um, making that happen in classrooms. So I would say, again, Apple is, is sort of in the lead in terms of um, furthering mobile learning in the classroom. Um, they also have an excellent network of professional developers and distinguished educators. So, uh, you know, Apple, again, being furthest along in terms of supporting initiatives like this, I'm not as aware of Google and Microsoft being as proactive uh, and, and to have as many resources as Apple does. Um, but, but again, the reality is that we are in a multi-device um, environment, and uh, so as someone who sort of oversees uh, mobility for the university and faculty development, we definitely want to consider uh, the multiple devices that students bring. So I think long-term, that's our direction. Uh, Short-term, I think the Apple solution has been, has been a good one for us. Thank you. Dion, advantages, disadvantages of operating systems? Yeah, well, there were definite advantages to starting with Apple, and so far we've stayed with Apple. We've contemplated uh, BYOD, a device-neutral approach, a number of times and always go back to Apple. Uh, one of the main reasons there was a question about accessibility that we went with Apple to begin with was that their hardware was superior and software, so that was a big selling point. And then, you know, the ease of use. It's just so much easier to support when you're on uh, one type of device. Now, having said that, some faculty will let their students come in and use other devices. So in those cases, they really try to use the apps that work equally well across all devices. Um, so yeah, pretty much Apple gave a lot of advantages. Okay, great. This might be a good uh, uh, place to take some more questions. Uh, um, so any questions out there, Julius, Mike? Uh, hello, yes, yeah. this is Julius. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just had a question uh, for myself. <laughs> so. The question is, uh, what sort of data is, what sort of data, what sort of evidence is the most valuable to capture at each phase of a tablet uh, deployment or mobile device deployment? Anybody want to take that? I'd be happy to, um, unless John or Nick, you guys want to grab it? No? Okay. Uh, I would just lead with, right at this moment, just with learning outcomes that, you know, that's so important to the faculty 
there was this report this morning in the higher ed uh, journal that, um, you know, a study that was done uh, at the military academy. And, um, you know, it all comes down to, you know, in order for faculty to invest time, there really has to be some return um, for them in terms of student improvement, student satisfaction. Um, so I would just, you know, continue to, to stress that, that that is that really is important. Yeah, and I would, I would second that, focus on those learning outcomes. As hard as it is to gather data that it's having a direct impact, it can be done. You know, you keep every variable the same except the teaching method, you keep the faculty the same, the time of the class the same, and then you can really get some empirical results. Um, but don't get overly focused on those. We also saw amazing anecdotes of how new skills develop that would be directly applicable for the workforce, you know, whether it's physical therapists being able to gather research and diagnose an ankle with an iPad. So uh, really keep a, an open perspective, but don't forget those learning outcomes. Uh, for me, I'm not going to, I'm going to echo what uh, two previous colleagues said, but uh, not talk about that. Uh, for me, uh, in 2013 and uh, onwards, each year there was mobile learning research funds uh, available to faculty. Um, the first ones are coming in now, uh, and it's amazing that the types of um, research that faculty are doing within mobile learning in their courses and in their, in their disciplines. Um, what are the what are the best of, you know evaluation we can do? Those that are important to faculty. Um, they're the ones that they're pursuing uh, with all their, uh, I suppose, research power. Uh, and we're only just starting to see the, the fruits of their labor now. Um, we've probably got around uh, 40 to 50 uh, grants coming in over the next uh, couple of years, uh, again, in, in phases. So um, those will be interesting to see the narrative that's happened at uh, Zayed University. Great. Thank you very much. So now we get to pick your brain uh, even more and find out how you learned all the great things that you know uh, uh, about tablets. So where do we go for more information? So what specific resources, conferences, events, organizations, et cetera, um, uh, would you suggest uh, for people to look into for additional information on mobile devices and teaching and learning? We'll go back to John uh, uh, first to start us off. Where would you send me, John? I would send you to Apple. Um, again, they're the leader in terms of you know this space. Um, building technologies that are education focused in, in many ways um, in the apps that they provide in the resources that they provide the professional networking opportunities with um, the Apple distinguished educators uh, that are out there. They also have a vast library of resources in iTunes U um, with you know a number of institutions uh, Dion's institution I think Dion has even written a book that is in iTunes U about mobile learning. Ohio State is another leader. Um, so, you know, they've, they've got this wonderful uh, resource and, and history. They're not just entering into education and um, technology. They've been leaders in this space for many years. So, you know, I, I, I try not to be vendor uh, dependent or uh, agnostic, but uh, Apple is definitely a, an excellent resource for anyone wanting to learn more about mobile learning. Um, so that, so they're definitely great. Educause is, is also a good resource. They've, uh, you know, conducted some studies and they have a, a strong network of academics and practitioners and IT folks who have, have conducted studies at their schools. So check the Educause website for um, the, the number of work, um, the work that has been already produced. Uh, look for conferences. As, um, as Mike mentioned, we hosted an iPad in higher ed conference here uh, this March, and uh, we were privileged to have Dion here as one of our keynote speakers, uh, and a number of other international um, presenters who spoke, you know, highly of, of the iPad and mobile learning and provided evidence of, uh, you know, gains in, in their schools in terms of learning and, and satisfaction. Um, there'll be a proceedings. Uh, there are proceedings coming uh, in a month or two, and I'll make those available from our website. I'll also put in the chat the website that you can go to to learn more about the conference and some of the speakers. Great. Excellent. Nick, what's in your secret sauce? Um, you, there's a lot of information out there about the technology. 
Uh, YouTube would be a great one. Uh, you know, any of the apps you uh, have come across today, you can YouTube it and it will show you exactly how to use it. Um, what's not there and what's maybe a little bit harder to find is uh, specific information about the pedagogy behind it, uh, how to innovate your class, how to make it interactive, engaging. Um, yes, Educause for sure, um, these conferences that are around, uh, Edutopia, um, eLearning Guild uh, offer a little bit as well. Um, these, are the, these are the ones that are a bit more hard, a uh, bit harder to come by. Um, and why if you are a uh, you know someone that's interested in both the technology and the pedagogy then you may become that first champion at your institute um, you know and people will learn a lot from you so yeah that's I think it to go so where to go for more info maybe yourself <laughs> <laughs> excellent thanks Nick Dion yeah, many of the conferences have never already been um, stated. Another one is WCET. They have some really good initiatives and the uh, online learning consortium as well. So I think most major conferences are going to have a session on mobile learning, mobile devices. Um, and I think networking with the campuses that were underway was absolutely invaluable for us. So Ohio State, uh, UC Irvine has a great iPad program in their medical school of Jackson State. So just learning, sometimes we would just throw up a, a session and have members of those universities join and share best practices. So those almost became a little internal conference. So just search the conferences and, and network. Excellent, great. Um, well, while we're at it, I just want to throw some out there too. Um, uh, it's very practical stuff. So uh, uh, this recommendation is probably directed more at K through 12 educators, but I found a lot of useful things there for higher ed as well. Richard Byrne has a blog, uh, uh, Free Technology for Teachers, and he's got two other blogs that kind of work with it, uh, Android for Schools and iPad Apps for Schools. And uh, I follow those blogs uh, um, quite regularly. He posts um, some really useful things. And he doesn't just announce the app, uh, but he also uh, often gives you specific instructions and examples of how the app might be used uh, in an educational setting. So thanks for those tips, uh, uh, guys. So I'll turn uh, to Julius uh, and Mike and uh, see if we've got more questions uh, here. So Julius, have you found any more? Or this is Mike here. <laughs> I have oh, the yeah. next uh -huh. one. So um, James Maloney, uh, and Dion have been sort of exchanging a bit on this, but the, uh, maybe this is, I'll broaden the question a bit about accessibility, how mobile technology and accessibility work together. And maybe Dion, you can start uh, talking about sort of what was the process to ensure that students who needed uh, special accommodations would be able to use the device and not be a hindrance or a barrier. Sure, well first, I mean, there, a lot of accessibility was built into Apple. When we started to look for apps, that was the biggest um, challenge, I think. So we developed with our um, accommodation centers a six-step process for faculty to actually test the apps. And each one, they had to fill out a form and they had, you know, show them how to walk through it. And then they had to submit the results to us. And if the app wasn't sufficiently accessible, then there could be alternative accommodations met or we would search for a, a, a substitute app. We also had a recommended set of 10 apps when we began and all of those were uh, completely tested for accessibility. So I think, um, you know, that's the way it's continued. Our faculty had gradually got used to it. They, they tested the apps themselves and also captioning became a really big deal. I'm sure a lot of you know captioning is incredibly expensive, but it is basically a requirement. So we always have transcripts. Whenever there's a video embedded in an iBook, you know, everything, everything has to be captioned. So that was a big deal as well. Any of our other panelists want to chime in on that one? I won't make you. It's okay. So, uh, Julius, have you found any other questions? Well, yes. Uh, so th there are some sort of specific questions. Someone asked specifically about iBooks Author. That, that's Manuel Fernandez. Has anyone had any good experiences or bad experiences with iBooks Author? I can answer that. Um, we've had both, uh, mainly good for our tablet classes. As I mentioned earlier, most of our faculty created iBooks. And we've had one example that, well, actually, in physical therapy, one faculty member created such a beautiful iBook that the program is becoming known for the content. So it can be an extremely power powerful way to deliver 
um, the, the content. In cases where the iPad was less relied upon, our faculty used packages like soft chalk and sometimes even PDFs. I think the only limitation right now with iBooks Author is that obviously it's not accessible. It really requires you to have an iPad. Yes, you can print it out as a PDF, but then you lose some of the benefits of the iBooks itself. But if, you're, if your students have iPads, then it's definitely the way to go. It's a great program. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would also say that there are some good and bad experiences with uh, iBooks Author. The good are really good. Uh, it, it makes that, um, you know, the flat page just so interactive, very engaging. There's, there's all the time there's widgets being available that you can easily um, uh, you know, drop into the book and, you know, sky's the limit, honestly. Um, however, um, I suppose the bad come with uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Dion mentioned there's a multimedia person at your your um, institute sort of dedicated to this um, you know often faculty aren't uh, content writers or multimedia technologists um, and so whilst the the ideas are, are way up here the actual end out output is kind of unfortunately not as uh, convincing or or needs a little bit more work um, I suppose that's just the nature of the technology you, you think you can do a lot with it but uh, you know sometimes there is a bit of a letdown um, shouldn't be disheartened, but yeah, that's, I suppose, our good and bad. I would also add that whenever we do look at iBooks Author, which is a wonderful uh, tool, the question about copyright always comes up. So do make sure you have some expertise um, so that your faculty can go to those individuals about questions uh, regarding copyright, because that is, that, I know that that's an important uh, concern and question for faculty who are entering into, um, you know, producing books using these tools. Thank you. I see another uh, question out there um, um, that I'd like to know the answer to as well. I have not encountered uh, uh, any apps that had any kind of direct um, integration with learning management systems. Um, uh, um, that tie into Blackboard's gradebook, for example. Um, uh, does anybody know of any uh, formative feedback apps uh, uh, specifically that coordinate with the gradebook in Blackboard? Uh, I can, I suppose, have a workaround for that. Um, and you're not gonna be able to do it. In my experience, you're not gonna be able to do that uh, only with an iPad. Um, you would need to um, have a laptop. Uh, a lot of these websites allow for you to uh, produce the results of a Socrative quiz or a Neopod uh, in um, Excel format. And so then you would uh, drop that Excel document or that table into uh, your Blackboard Grade Center. I haven't done it before. I'm just assuming that's what uh, people do. Um, I haven't come across something direct that would drop into Grade Center. Sounds nice though, doesn't it? <laughs> Hey, Anybody else have any other questions? Nick, uh, um, uh, do you have any other tips to give us or any of our other panelists uh, tips to give us about mobile devices in general? It's the future, so it's, you know, now is the time to uh, start a small initiative on your campus or to, uh, you know, get some faculty together to have these types of conversations. It's, uh, it's certainly growing. It certainly is an area where, where we as educators and practitioners um, can sort of capitalize on uh, the use of technology for student learning. The students have the technology today um, and it, it, you know, they're very mobile and so these devices I think can be utilized for education better than they have been in the past and we just, you know, I think it's, we're still so early at this stage so, so don't be afraid to, um, you know, to explore it further. I think it's important um, for us to do this in higher education. Thank you. Mike, I think you had a question in the pipeline uh, uh, about grants. Yeah, so um, Terry Gustafsson asked about grants uh, and I'm gonna maybe broaden this a little bit. And uh, some of you, um, you know, Nick and I think Dion and even uh, maybe John, you've talked about the idea of using grants to sort of promote a foster mobile learning among your faculty. Can you elaborate a bit more about what were some of the criteria and what were the expectations from, from the grant uh, process? Sure, I 
can answer, uh, in terms of our own campus, our faculty did receive small grants as incentives through release time to uh, either create content or develop new, uh, new pedagogies for teaching. Uh, they were held to a deliverable, so you know, they had to actually show us what they produced at the end or f feedback in, in the form of an e-portfolio often to complete their funding, so to get all of their funding. In terms of broader grants, there are plenty out there. We haven't gotten any um, specific ones, but I know they're out there for mobile learning, so I would encourage people to look. Anyone else to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for our uh, research grants um, specific to the faculty, um, in their proposal, they had uh, research um, goals, um, you know, their thesis and things like that. Um, also, um, what they were going to produce as a result of their research. And they also targeted a conference and journal in which to present and publish. Uh, whether they use the funding for that or um, is, I'm not sure. Um, but I suppose, yes, there was a specific output um, requirement for faculty. Excellent. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, uh, we're about to conclude here. I just want to touch base one more time uh, with Mike and Julius to see if there are any more. I, I think I think that's about it. Yeah, uh, awesome. All uh, right. Sort of got addressed through the chat as well. Okay, so, well, thank you uh, uh, to everyone, especially to our special guests, uh, um, uh, John and Nick and Dion, uh, for taking the time to share their expertise, their experience, their knowledge, and their excitement uh, with all of us. Um, we will make this recording available to you uh, uh, quite soon. Uh, we'll send you out a link uh, for that. We'll also send you out a link of um, a list of uh, the apps that folks uh, brought up uh, during the webinar. We'll share it at our website, which I encourage you to follow as well. Uh, our WordPress site. Um, uh, please do contact us when you filled out the registration form. You should have had an opportunity to express um, uh, interest and perhaps expertise in a specific area of instructional technology. So we're thinking about what the next uh, webinar is going to be about, and we're looking at you, everybody. So uh, uh, we want you to be a part of it, not just an attendee, but as an, a contributor uh, uh, as well. So uh, please do uh, that. Um, uh, the three of us, uh, uh, Mike, Julius, and I, of course, will also be at the POD uh, uh, conference, the Professional and Organizational Development Network Conference um, uh, in Louisville, uh, in Kentucky, in uh, November. So we hope that we can see you there. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>